journey. I want to personally thank each and every one of you who gave of yourselves in time and ability and whatever else you contributed in support of Julie Mayer and her extended family and the loss of our own Virginia. It was unexpected and sudden. And as you have heard me say from time to time, life turns on a dime. And immediately you're experiencing things you can't control. While you were attending to your care, I was likewise engaged in that one week into her three week visit, my spiritual daughter, Hannah, whom many of you know, others of you have seen, received the news that her dad unexpectedly died of a massive heart attack. And so I escorted that discombobulated young woman to her grieving mother's side and I spent a few days there trying to offer comfort and strength as I also honored my friend, her father, at his funeral service. This morning, I received a, um, I awakened to a thank you note. There's a picture of this uh, family, I believe available to us. Um, Alex was a, a city planner, retired city planner, and an artist, he was a sculptor, and his, uh, his magnificent works are scattered across the landscape of the Ukraine. And I've had a chance to visit him in his studio, in his home, dined with the family and earned his trust so that he would allow his daughter to accompany me on the many journeys we've made in that country and the few visits she's made to my home. But this morning in my email was this note to you from Hannah Samsura. On behalf of my mom and myself, I'd like to express our deep and sincere gratitude for supporting us in what has been the worst time of our life in my dad's passing. Thank you for your generosity in giving finances, but most of all, thank you for the generosity of spirit, your kind words and messages, your prayers and words of wisdom and insight. Thank you for allowing the Lord to create a place of healing and restoration in our Father's house. If it wasn't for you all, Pastor Lanny would never be able to do what he's doing, even with the Holy Spirit on his side. Thank you for allowing him to be with us at this time of heartbreak. Thank you for making me feel like I'm yours. When I think of you all, I think of the kindness and goodness of the Lord. Keeping you in my feeble prayers, all my love, Hannah. The two experiences we've just had in the last 10 days cut through all the clutter of life and bring us to the sudden reality that relationships really do matter. The fashion in which so many friends and family gathered here and in another country was a testimony to the lives that had been lived among us. We knew the generosity of Virginia's spirit. She was constantly saying, I love you. Always grateful for our father's house, willing to serve wherever her grace would allow her to do that. And she, her presence influenced many of us. The same was true for Alex in that situation over there. And when we, when we get down to the death issue, suddenly life becomes very simple. Relationships really do matter. And in those moments, as in other events in life, you want to have that sense of relational connection that allows you to rest in confidence and trust as someone else makes the decisions that you are too befuddled to even consider. In sharp contrast to that is an experience I had some years ago with a family in the church now gone on to wherever it was the Lord sent them. But the wife's brother died homeless on the streets of Baltimore and his remains lay in the morgue with John Doe taped to his toe 
until through a series of serendipitous situations, his body was delivered to his sister who had him cremated and then we went out onto the bay to spread his ashes and when I gave them the opportunity to say something, there was nothing to say. He had been disconnected from the family for so long, nobody even knew him anymore. And he died alone on the streets. That's not who we are. That's not what God has given us. We're a family. Once you come into relationship with Christ, you're reconciled to your father and you have an international family. You have a temporal and an eternal family. He, he is the father from whom all families are named in heaven and in earth. Right now we're living on the bottom floor, but eventually you're going to live on the top floor. And trust me, if there's a balcony, I'm going to lean over with that crowd of heavenly witnesses to see how you're carrying on. <laughs> and I don't mean carrying on. <laughs> As we consider the circumstances of our involvement in the lives of others, there are things that we morph into over time. Patty and I arrived in this community, it would be 40 years ago this coming October. And we came to this <clears throat> little rundown building on the other end of town in this tiny little congregation with an Italian preacher. You could tell he was preaching, even if you couldn't hear him. And in those days, I was 27 when we got here. I'm 67 now. You know what that means? Reminds me of something my wife said one morning some years ago. She's through primping. I'm standing at the adjacent sink and she says, you know, when I look in the mirror, and I'm borrowing her quote now for you, I realize I really have given you the best years of my life. <laughs> <clears throat> in those days, the Lord tagged me to lead this place, to be the chief influencer here. And in those days, I was still somewhat broken. The circumstances of life brought me to the place where performance for acceptance was the mode of operation in my life. And I was going to build a great church for God. And then people showed up. <laughs> At that time, I was busy trying to build a something, spending myself on that. But as the Lord has brought me forward in, in time, I realized that without relationships, all you're doing is piling bricks and they won't stand the test of time because relationship is the mortar that holds us in place when the storms come. Relationships is what holds a congregation, a spiritual household, and the kingdom of God in heaven and in earth. That's what holds us together. It's what the Father has given us that joins us to him by his spirit. Now, <clears throat> I have two priorities, two major priorities at this point in my life. The first is that I make a smooth transition from my leadership over these four decades into the administration of Jay and Katie and their leadership team. Have any of you ever lived through the tra pastoral transition in another situation? Is it something you would like to see happen that way again? It's been messy, messy, messy. I began praying about this years ago because I was unwilling to be a part of the chaos that I had reviewed time and time again across the landscape of this country and other places as you watch the changing of the crook, as it's called, not go very well. Some people say, what are you going to do when you retire? I don't understand the concept of retirement. Do you, do you get to not do God anymore? 
I mean, if you're, if you're your father's representative, you always are. Even how you die should reflect his glory. Okay? So the notion of retirement is nonsense. It's just a turning of page to a different chapter of life. And my primary occupation will be the continuation of the support and encouragement of my spiritual household, which spreads across several nations. So for me, it's just a, a different scenario, but the same task, putting my father on display into the lives of those who have given me standing in their life to encourage and affirm them and help stand them up in the call of God on their life. When Jay talks about vision, he's talking about the trajectory God has given us and the things that he and his generation will enrich upon that foundation. Every legitimate father wants their son to be more than they ever were. Amen. And to spend themselves seeing their good success and the thing God's called them to. When you have that heart, you always have activity that needs to be done. There are foundational truths that need to be passed from one generation to the other. Thank you, son. There are experiences that, you know, I've said for a long, long time, I would rather learn from someone than spend years reinventing the wrong wheel, okay? If we were um, just, our, if our only preoccupation was bringing people to Jesus, okay, get them saved, get them saved, get them saved, get them saved, what does that tell you? It says in every generation, you have to start all over again because you're always dealing with first generation persons. Jay is third generation righteousness. His three sons will be fourth generation righteousness. Do you know how valuable that is to the kingdom of God? I would not want any of you to have to live the life I've lived to learn the things I can freely give you. You don't want that journey. You're going to get your own pain, I promise. <laughs> but the pain is where you learn the lessons. <laughs> no, no, I'll get it. <laughs> because there's always something stirring. For instance, <clears throat> how many of you, by show of hands, have been born since 1980? Okay. <laughs> well, you know, Marty, the memory is the first thing to go. <laughs> I'm going this morning, those of you born since 1980 are going to be talked about. But you're going to be talked about in your presence. Okay? Because there are things that Jay and his administration will face that are totally different from I and my generation. Okay? Now, for you this side of 80, y'all have a nickname. You're called millennials. And my generation thinks millennials are weird. Okay? And so when my generation says to that generation, well, this is what you need to do. <laughs> there you go. Whatever. <laughs> Now, <clears throat> don't be offended, millennials, with what I'm about to show you, because what I'm about to show you is an inaccurate analysis of what it means to be a millennial. But you'll hear the old people laugh, because they're going to get it, okay? So this is an observation, and then on the other side, we'll have an ex explanation. Let her rip. Ding, ticka, ding, ticka, ding, 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 ding.
Now that is an observation from one generation toward another. And it puts its finger on two or three strings that indicate something is radically different than it was in the past. And for those who look and laugh, they see the incongruence. And for those on the receiving end of that criticism, they say, well, why are you picking on us? Now, just this weekend, I was exposed to a very insightful explanation that undergirds that observation. And so for the next 15 minutes, you're going to get an education about the generation that is among us and will continue to be part of us in the coming years. So pay close attention and be instructed about what will be our obligation to that generation once we understand this explanation. Um, what's the millennial question? Apparently millennials as a generation, which is a group of people who were born approximately uh, 1984 and after, um, uh, are tough to manage. And they're accused of being entitled and narcissistic and self-interested, unfocused, lazy. <laughs> but entitled is the big one. And, uh, and because they confound leadership so much, What's happening is leaders are asking the millennials, what do you want? And millennials are saying, we want to work in a place with purpose, love that. Um, we want to make an impact, you know, whatever that means. Um, uh, we want free food and bean bags. Uh, and so somebody articulates some sort of purpose, there's lots of free food and there's bean bags, and yet for some reason they are still not happy. And that's because um, you, the, they're missing, there's, there's, a, there's a missing piece. Um, what I've learned is that there, I can break it down into four pieces, right? There are four, four things, four characteristics. One is parenting, the other one is uh, technology, the third is impatience, and the fourth is environment. The generation that we call the millennials, too many of them grew up um, subject to, not my words, failed parenting strategies, you know? where, for example, they were told that they were special all the time. They were told that they could have anything they want in life just because they want it, right? They were told, um, uh, some of them got into um, honors classes not because they deserved it but because their parents complained. And some of them got A's not because they earned them but because the teachers didn't want to deal with the parents. Some kids got participation medals. You got a medal for coming in last. Right? Which the science we know is pretty clear, which is it devalues the medal and the reward for those who actually work hard. And that actually makes the person who comes in last feel embarrassed because they know they didn't deserve it. So it actually makes them feel worse. Mm. Right? So you take this group of people and they graduate school and they get a job and they're thrust into, an, into the real world. And in an instant, they find out they're not special. Their moms can't get them a promotion. Um, that you get nothing for coming in last. And by the way, you can't just have it because you want it. Right? And in an instant, their entire self-image is shattered. And so you have an entire generation that's growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations. The other problem to compound it is we're growing up in a Facebook, Instagram world. In other words, we're good at putting filters on things. We're good at showing people that life is amazing even though I'm depressed, right? And so everybody sounds tough and everybody sounds like they got it all figured out. And the reality is there's very little toughness and most people don't have it figured out. And so when the more senior people say, well, what should we do? They sound like, this is what you gotta do. And they have no clue, right? So you have an entire generation growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations, right? Through no fault of their own, through no fault of their own, right? They were dealt a bad hand, right? Now let's add in technology. We know that Engagement with social media and our cell phones releases a chemical called dopamine. That's why when you get a text, it feels good, right? So, you know, we've all had it where you're feeling a little bit down or feeling a bit lonely. And so you send out 10 texts to 10 friends, you know, hi, 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 hi. Because <laughs> it feels good when you get a response, right? Right? 
It's why we count the likes. It's why we go back ten times to see if and if it's going. If our if my Instagram is growing slower, I would. I, I, did I do something wrong? Do they not like me anymore? Right? The, the trauma for young kids to be unfriended. Right? Because we know when you get it, you get a hit of dopamine, which feels good. It's why we like it. It's why we keep going back to it. Dopamine is the exact same chemical that makes us feel good when we smoke, when we drink, and when we gamble. In other words, it's highly, highly addictive, right? We have age restrictions on smoking, gambling, and uh, alcohol, and we have no age restrictions on social media and cell phones, which is the equivalent of opening up the liquor cabinet and saying to our teenagers, hey, by the way, this adolescence thing, if it gets you down... <laughs> But that's basically what's happening. That's basically what's happening, right? That's basically what happened. You have an entire generation that has access to an addictive, numbing t chemical called dopamine through social media and cell phones as they're going through the high stress of adolescence. Why is this important? Almost every alcoholic discovered alcohol when they were teenagers. When we're very, very young, the only approval we need is the approval of our parents. And as we go through adolescence, we make this transition where we now need the approval of our peers. Very frustrating for our parents, very important for us. It allows us to acculturate outside of our immediate families into the broader tribe, right? It's a highly, highly stressful and anxious period of our lives, and we're supposed to learn to rely on our friends. Some people, quite by accident, discover alcohol and numbing effects of dopamine to help them cope with the stresses and anxieties of adolescence. Unfortunately, that becomes hardwired in their brains. And for the rest of their lives, when they suffer significant stress, they will not turn to a person, they will turn to the bottle. Social stress, financial stress, career stress, that's pretty much the primary reasons why an alcoholic drinks, right? What's happening is because we're allowing unfettered access to these dopamine-producing devices and media, basically it's becoming hardwired. And what we're seeing is as they grow older, they, too many kids don't know how to form deep, meaningful relationships. Their words, not mine. They will admit that many of their friendships are superficial. They will admit that their friends, that they don't count on their friends, they don't rely on their friends, they have fun with their friends, but they also know that their friends will cancel on them if something better comes along. Deep, meaningful relationships are not there because they never practice the skill set, and worse, they don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. So when significant stress starts to show up in their lives, they're not turning to a person, they're turning to a device, they're turning to social media, they're turning to these things which offer temporary relief. We know, the science is clear, we know that people who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook, right? These things balanced. Alcohol is not bad, too much alcohol is bad. Gambling is fun, too much gambling is dangerous, right? There's nothing wrong with social media and cell phones. It's the imbalance, right? If you're sitting at dinner with your friends and you're texting somebody who's not there, that's a problem. That's an addiction. If you're sitting in a meeting with people you're supposed to be listening to and speaking and you put your phone on the table, face up or face down, I don't care, that sends a subconscious message to the room that you're, not just, you're just not that important to me right now, right? That's what happens. And the fact that you cannot put it away is because you are addicted, right? If you wake up and you check your phone before you say good morning to your girlfriend, boyfriend, or spouse, you have an addiction. And like all addiction, in time, it'll destroy relationships, it'll cost time, and it'll cost money, and it'll make your life worse, right? So you have a generation growing up with lower self-esteem that doesn't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress, right? Now you add in the sense of impatience, right? They've grown up in a world of instant gratification. You want to buy something? You go on Amazon, it arrives the next day. You want to watch a movie? Log on and watch a movie. You don't check movie times. You want to watch a TV show? Binge. You don't even have to wait week to week to week, right? I know people who skip seasons just so they can binge at the end of the season, right? <laughs> Instant gratification. You want to go on a date, you don't even have to learn how to be like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to learn and practice that skill. You don't have to be the uncomfortable one who says, says yes when you mean no and says no when you mean no and yes when you, you don't have to swipe right. Bang, I'm a stud, <laughs> right? You don't even have to learn the social coping mechanisms, right? Everything you want, you can have instantaneously. Everything you want, instant gratification, except job satisfaction and strength of relationships, there ain't no app for that. They are slow, meandering, uncomfortable, messy processes.
And so I keep meeting these wonderful, fantastic, idealistic, hardworking, smart kids. They've just graduated school. They're in their entry-level job. And I sit down with them and I go, how's it going? They go, I think I'm going to quit. I'm like, why? They're like, I'm not making an impact. I'm like, you've been here eight months. <laughs> you know? It's as if they're standing at the foot of a mountain and they have this abstract concept called impact that they want to have in the world, which is the summit. What they don't see is the mountain. I don't care if you go up the mountain quickly or slowly, but there's still a mountain. And so what this young generation needs to learn is patience. That some things that really, really matter, like love, or job fulfillment, joy, love of life, self-confidence, a skill set, any of these things, all of these things take time. Sometimes you can expedite pieces of it, but the overall journey is arduous and long and difficult. And if you don't ask for help and learn that skill set, you will fall off the mountain or you will, the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario, and we're already seeing it, the worst case scenario is we're seeing an increase in suicide rates, we're seeing an increase in this generation. We're seeing an increase in accidental deaths due to drug overdoses. We're seeing more and more kids drop out of school or take leaves of absence due to depression. Unheard of. These are all, this, is, this is really bad. The best case scenario, the best, those are all bad cases, right? The best case scenario is you'll have an entire population growing up and going through life and just never really finding joy. They'll never really find deep, deep fulfillment in work or in life. They'll just waft through life and it'll be just, it's fine. How, how, how's your job? It's fine, it's the same as yesterday. How's your relationship? It's fine. Like that's, that's the best case scenario, which leads me to the, the fourth point, which is environment, which is we're taking this amazing group of young, fantastic kids who were just dealt a bad hand, it's no fault of their own, and we put them in corporate environments that care more about the numbers than they do about the kids. They care more about the short-term gains than the long-term life of this young human being. We care more about the year than the lifetime, right? And so we are putting them in corporate environments that aren't helping them build their confidence, that aren't helping them learn the skills of cooperation, that aren't helping them overcome the challenges of a digital world and finding more balance, that isn't helping them overcome the need to have instant gratification and teach them the joys and impact and the fulfillment you get from working hard over on something for a long time that cannot be done in a month or even in a year. And so we're thrusting to them, them in corporate environments and the worst part about it is they think it's them. They blame themselves. They, can't, they think it's them who can't deal. And so it makes it all worse. It's not. I'm here to tell them it's not them. It's the corporations. It's the corporate environments. It's the total lack of good leadership in our world today that is making them feel the way they do. They were dealt a bad hand and it's, and I hate to say it, but it's the company's responsibility. Sucks to be you, like we have no choice, right? This is what we got and I wish that society and their parents did a better job, they didn't. So we're, gonna, we're getting them in our companies and we now have to pick up the slack. We have to work extra hard to figure out the ways that we build their confidence. We have to work extra hard to find ways to teach them social, the social skills that they're missing out on. There should be no cell phones in conference rooms. None, zero. And I don't mean the kind of like sitting outside waiting to text. I mean like when you're sitting and waiting for a meeting to start, nobody go, this is what we all do. We all sit here and wait for the meeting to start. Meeting starting, okay. And we start the meeting. No, that's not how relationships are formed. Remember we talked about it's the little things. Relationships are formed this way. We're waiting for a meeting to start and we go, how's your dad? I heard he was in the hospital. Oh, he's really good, thanks for asking. He's actually at home now. Oh, I'm really glad, that was really amazing. I know, it was really scary for a while. That's how you form relationships. Hey, did you ever get that report on, oh my God, no I didn't. I'll help you out, I totally, I'll, can I help you out with that? Really? That's how trust forms. Trust doesn't form at an event, in a day. Even bad times don't form trust immediately. It's the slow, steady consistency. And we have to create mechanisms where we allow for those little innocuous interactions to happen. But when we allow cell phones in conference rooms, we just, okay, have the meeting. And then my favorite is like when there's a cell phone there and you go like this, you go. <laughs> it rings and you go. I'm not gonna answer that. Like, Mr. Magnanimous, you know? <laughs> when you're out for dinner with your friends, like, uh, 
I, I do this with my friends. When we're going out for dinner and we're leaving together, we'll, we'll leave our cell phones at home. Who are we calling? Maybe one of us will bring a phone in case we need to call an Uber or take a picture of our meal. That's what I was saying. Come on. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm an idealist, but I'm not insane. You know? <laughs> not a heathen. Uh, I mean, it looked really good. Um, we'll take one phone. And so it's like an alcoholic. The reason you take the alcohol out of the house is, be we, is because we cannot trust our willpower. We're just not strong enough. But when you remove the temptation, it actually makes it a lot easier. And so when you just say, don't check your phone, people literally will go like this. And somebody will go to the bathroom, and what's the first thing we do? Because <laughs> I wouldn't want to look around the restaurant for a minute and a half, you know? But if you don't have the phone, you just kind of enjoy the world. And that's where ideas happen. The constant, constant, constant engagement is not where you have innovation and ideas. Ideas happen when our minds wander and we go, and you see something, uh, I bet they could do that. That's called innovation, right? But we're taking away all those little moments, right? You should not, and none of us, none of us should charge our phones by our beds. We should be charging our phones in the living rooms, right? Remove the temptation. You wake up in the middle of the night because you can't sleep, you won't check your phone, which makes it worse. But if it's in the living room, it's relaxed, it's fine. I, I, uh, but it's my alarm clock. Buy an alarm clock. <laughs> <laughs> they cost $8, right? I'll, I'll buy you an alarm I was informed by this information because when I heard that one of the responses at Harvard, I believe it was Harvard Law School. One of the responses of those being trained to be lawyers, upon hearing that Trump had been elected, they were so inconsolable, they couldn't take their midterms. And I thought, these are going to be the lawyers? Law is stressful. You know, I've been puzzled by some of the things I just couldn't process properly until he awakened my understanding. Now, where does that leave us, okay? Yeah, they're here. More of them are coming. Why? Because the rest of us are going to die and they're going to come. What is it about our life that can help bridge that untrained life into a profitable future. How many of you have ever taken a, uh, a philosophy class? And what are some of the great questions? What are some of the great philosoph philosophical questions? Who am I? And why am I here? I am my father's son. And I'm here to represent him in this world. We answer at a very basic level the ancient questions of existence because we were breathed into existence for purpose. And we're given to one another to put his collective on display relationally. Why do you think the scripture spends so much time talking about reconciliation, going to your brother, not taking up an offense, doing works of repentance? Because there's something about the dynamic in which we are to live that glows with life. I have been in many church venues I have listened to the plaintive cry of leaders and congregants for many decades. And I can tell you this with authority, there ain't many places like our father's house. Because here you get to be human, you bunch of screw ups. <laughs> and it's okay. When I, when, I, when I say this to you, we will receive you in whatever condition you come but we will not allow you to remain in that condition. It presupposes you want to go on the journey, that you actually want to be healed. You actually want to be whole and comfortable inside your skin. We've got ministries all across the spectrum of getting you healthy in your mind, in your body, in your spirit. If your body will bend in that yoga class, <laughs> 
To you young people, I say this with real authority. <clears throat> Enjoy your knees while you, while you still have them. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, you can't expect a group of millennials to suddenly have a transforming relational experience when they've never had the opportunity to do it. So, ulcers, what does that say to us? What do we have to offer them? You know, I earned this gray hair. You did this to me. <laughs> but there's wisdom there. There's experience there that they should not have to relearn. They should have access to us old folks. You know, the call of God is on that generation just like it was on your generation. And we have a responsibility before God to build transgenerationally. That means some of us don't get to retire. We just to keep, keep going with the youngsters who will respond to our voices. Those who respond to the vibration your spirit sends out. How many of you over 50 are presently in relationship to somebody under 40? Okay, that's your field. Now, if we oldsters are going to be of any real value to these youngsters, we have to start partnering with them for their generation. We have got wisdom in this house. How many of you have had life beat some wisdom into you? You'll notice the gray heads are raising their hands. Now, the thing about young people is they don't know what wisdom is. They haven't, they haven't lived long enough. So when they get in, in trouble, where do they turn to? Somebody just as ignorant of wisdom as they are. And they conspire together, and then they both get flat tires. As we consider the transition that is already underway in our Father's house, I'm calling upon you, oldsters, to begin to partner with these youngsters in a relational context so that they know that there's somebody walking with them. There's someone they can turn to. You've got to build the love-trust relationship that lets them know when everything goes to hell in a handbasket, they can get a hold of you and you'll be there. You know, Zed gave us a wonderful exhortation today. And I sat there in agreement with him for this, this primary reason. I lived that. I do that because that's what I have become as a father. And you are on that journey with me. If I just took the next several hours, don't panic, and let you start testifying to what God has done for you personally since you walked across the threshold of this house, we would all be so thoroughly edified, we would all just want to stand and thank God for his mercy and grace to us through one another. I watch you sitting and talking. I see you passing Kleenex. I know someone pouring their heart out to you, and I know you've been trained to know how to respond to encourage them in the moment, because that's what we do here. So as this next generation comes in, I have a word. I just, I just have hope for them. I really have hope for them because I have confidence in the history God has given us and the trajectory this house is on. I know that Jay and his leadership team are building on a foundation. They don't have to start all over. But how many of you know you can add a room to a place and have a whole new adventure in it? You can reach out into the world and, and touch something that doesn't even exist in your sphere yet. Because we serve a God who is everywhere, doing stuff all the time. And as I've said so often, if you would just keep giving him your yes, you have no idea where you'll end up. But he will go before you. Well, that felt like it was over. I'm done now. <laughs> Y'all go to lunch now. <laughs> Listen. I was going to call all you old guys over in the corner, but i just tell you right now. I am appealing to you to begin to work with Jay and me and others to build the bridges of relationship into the youngsters with whom you're already relating. And let us become intentional 
about being connectable for those that God is going to send here. If you'll make a place for them, the Lord will fill the place for them. Okay? So I'm going to ask, in fact, I'll have Tim do it this week. I'll send out an email to all of you over 50 and find out who among you is willing to help us walk forward in this issue of connecting transgenerationally. You know, it's a, it's a real thrill for me to go to Keith and Nikki's house and cut up with their three sons because I know my voice is already in Keith's mouth. My words are there. So when the old guy comes in and says the same thing that daddy says, it gives credibility to daddy that he didn't have on his own. We collectively are an influence that's powerful. Would you stand? I'd like to welcome all the millennials this morning. <laughs> Trust you won't go away offended. <clears throat> We're for you. <laughs> and I'm not buying bean bags, so let's get that clear. <laughs> By all means, Pastor. I just want to say something really, really quick here. First of all, I am thankful to hear a perspective that looks towards the millennials that's a healthy look from the oldster generation, right? I'm before 1984, so I guess I'm an oldster generation person myself. But I just want to say that I appreciate a healthy look at this. And I also want to say to the millennials right now, those of many of whom I am close and dear friends with, I value so greatly that aspect that he brought out here, that desire to make an impact. I believe that is a God-breathed desire that is particular about your generation, mm -hmm. about this generation. God's going to do something amazing with that, okay? And so there's strength added when we combine relationships across these generations. Like nothing that we're ever going to see before or since, God is going to do some incredible things in our church body as we as we link arms, as we reach across the aisle, as we stand next to each other and with one another in what God has for us collectively. And there's going to be a huge impact that's going to come in this next generation. So I am personally extremely excited for that and what God's doing. This right here, this relationship is indicative of what God is doing in the future. So I'm, I'm just personally very pleased to hear this message coming forth of let's gain perspective on one another and how we together are going to walk into the future. Let me add that that is only one component of the requirements of our Father's house. I was recently made aware that I have erred in calling us an educated congregation. We are not an educated congregation. We are people who have been specialized vocationally. To be educated, you have to be experienced outside your single discipline in order to grasp the holistic purposes of God. And one of those is our cross-cultural learning curve. If God's going to keep sending us the nations, we have got to become educated about their culture and their history and own it collectively. We have a great learning curve ahead of us. But I have confidence in the Lord, and I am convinced that the spirit of this house is to say yes to where he's leading us. Father, we stand here as representatives of you, and we are challenged today by the clarity you're bringing us of how much we don't yet understand. But I thank you, Lord, that you've made us a teachable people. We are a relatable people. There's genuine love of God on display in this house. Healing occurs to the broken. You are at work among us, and we get to see your miracles over and over and over. Today, Father, I commit me and those who hear my voice to your purpose in moving us 
into a higher place of understanding, allowing us to see more distantly than we thought possible and to be more connected and connectable than we have imagined was possible. So I invite you, Holy Spirit, to seal these words in our heart, to put your courage in our spirit and allow our minds to apprehend your truths so that we become the people of God, putting your kingdom on display together. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. What? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. We're uh, celebrating Virginia's life. Uh, your, Tim and I were packing up cookies and stuff to send off and to bring the plates back to, the, to our church. And one of Virginia's nieces came up to me and said, Virginia always loved to do hospitality at your church. Why don't you take all these cookies and do that for Virginia for this Sunday? So all the things out there are from Virginia. Thank you. We'll meet our first time guests in the hospitality room. Hug somebody's neck on your way out. Enjoy the snacks. <laughs>